Okay, people, end in sight. Now, so I was talking the last time about um, Marx's conception of freedom and about the role that uh, freedom plays in his theory. And do you remember uh, I talked about different concepts of freedom, positive concepts of freedom, negative concepts of freedom, freedom of contract, and then Marx's notion of freedom as uh, the development of powers. Now, uh, when I say Marx had this idea that freedom to be free consisted in developing your powers, uh, of course, that notion of developing your powers actually has two subcomponents to it, which I think I mentioned, but I didn't talk about at great length. Namely, one dimension of, so what does it mean to say that a society is free, to say that, it, or, or an individual is free. It's to say that they have powers, they have developed powers. Now, to say they have developed powers can partly mean what is the absolute level of productive powers that they have. What is the total amount of product they can produce? How many shoes can they produce in a year? How many tons of coal? How many, how many uh, ships? What is the, what is the actual what is the actual level of development of their powers? But Marx says there's actually another dimension to power, which is not the only the actual level of the development of powers, but also the extent to which the powers that are developed have been appropriated or are appropriated or are under the control of the people who are the subjects of freedom. So there's a separate dimension. One dimension is how much power do we have. The other dimension is how much control do I have over these powers. Again, this notion of my powers and my control over my powers is really central for him. Uh, uh, and it, it's central, as you see, in the whole discussion of alienation. Alienation is, in a way, a state of affairs where my powers are out of my control. So that's, so that's what, Mar so it's important to see that Marx thinks that a certain kind of phenomenon exists, which we are not inclined to think exist. We're inclined to think if you have powers, you have powers, and that's the end of the story. But Marx thinks there are cases in which you in some sense have powers, but you don't have control over those powers. You are in some sense the means through which powers express themselves. You as an industrial worker are in some sense a cog in a machine that's producing enormous amounts of things. So in some sense you're exercising these powers, but you're not exercising these powers in a way that means you have control over these powers. And again, think of the, the, the comparison that he's got in mind, I think. The medieval cobbler produces few shoes, very few shoes, but the powers that the medieval cobbler has are powers that he has assimilated fully or, or he is in control of. He decides what leather to buy. He knows what kind of leather is good for what purposes. He decides what shape the shoe will be in. He controls the, 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 the way in which the shoe is produced. So he has a relatively low level of productive power, but he has a relatively high level of control over those powers he has. So uh, he can't produce a lot, but what he does produce, he really produces. He knows what he's doing. He, he produces them, uh, and, and he's in control of the process of developing and exercising his powers in the production of them. Compare that with the industrial worker in the 19th century, and the industrial worker in the 19th century, he says, Marx says, is characterized as a person who is the conduit through which certain developed social powers get exercised, but he himself does not have an appropriated control over those powers. So if I sit at the machine and, pr and press a button, in one sense, my pressing of the button is an expression of a tremendously developed social power. Because if I press the button, the shoe comes out. And I can press the button a hundred times. And so the medieval cobbler produces five shoes a day. I sit at the machine in, in, in Prague and press the button, and a hundred shoes come out a day. So there's a, in some sense, Mark says, there's a greater 
amount of power that I'm in, there's a greater amount of power that's, that I'm wielding, that's going through me. But the greater amount of power that's going through me is not a kind of power over which I, as the person who wields it, have as much control as the medieval cobbler. Because I didn't make the machine, um, I, didn't, I don't set the, the work times, uh, I don't uh, set the controls on how the, 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 the shoes are produced, etc. So it's this discrepancy, and in a way, that's the discrepancy that Marx is really keen to think about uh, when you think about, about history. He's interested in history as a process in which freedom develops, but freedom develops along these different dimensions. So freedom develops along the dimension of increase of total social powers. Freedom also develops along the dimension of people getting more and more control, reappropriating more and more fully th the powers that they have. The German term here is aneignung, right? Or wieder aneignung, the making the power your own. Liter aneignung means eigen is one's own. So ich eigne mir die, 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 diese Kräfte an. I appropriate these powers. I make these powers my own. So the industrial worker hasn't made those social powers his own to the extent to which the medieval craftsman made those powers his own. So there's one dimension which is the absolute amount of power. There's another dimension which is the appropriation of power. And that's connected, of course, with the other distinction which I talked about before, which is the notion of social powers and individual powers, right? There's a connection between those two things. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's, but that, so, so that all of history, so all of history, according to Marx, is a sequence of stages in which those dimensions go out of kilter and come back in, go out of phase with each other and come back into phase with each other. They, uh, they, uh, they, they and that, that's what, so, so it's important to see that the, the uh, fable convenu, the, 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 the myth that you might hear, namely that you can think of political movements in the 19th and 20th century as diverse developments of the triad which guided the French Revolution, right? The French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. And now, as you know, people have often said, if you see that slogan, liberty, uh, equality, fraternity, you can see the three major movements in the 19th century is arising from that. Freedom is liberalism, right? Liber is free. Freedom is, uh, liberalism is the doctrine which gives a kind of priority to freedom. Marxism is a as, a, as the doctrine which gives a kind of priority to equality, egalité and anarchism as the, uh, the, 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 the theory that gives a kind of uh, priority to fraternity. So that's the story that's told. Now I must say that that is completely wrong as far as Marx is concerned, completely wrong. That's because for Marx, it isn't that the advantage of a post-capitalist society is supposed to exist in the fact that it is equal that's not the advantage. The advantage is supposed to lie in the fact that a post-capitalist society is freer in the appropriate sense of free. So the Marxist will say the liberal can claim that his position, her position, is a special instance of freedom uh, only because of the limited concept of freedom that they use. They think of freedom only as freedom of contract and negative freedom. If you understand freedom correctly, you'll see that for Marx, freedom is the central concept, really. Uh, and the other thing, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that in detail now, but I've talked about this in my writings ad nauseum, so I'm a bit bored with saying it again. But I'll, I will say something about it later. But you remember from, well, for Marx, equality is an illusion. So freedom is an actual substantive scientific concept. You can, quasi-scientific concept, you can measure freedom. 
you can measure the extent to which the forces of production are developed, and you can measure the extent to which people have control over those forces. Now it's easy to now you might say it's easy to to measure the total amount of productive powers, but how do you measure the extent to which a person has control over those powers? And that's admittedly the case. You can measure output, and so you can measure the absolute quantity of, uh, uh, of productive powers. It's a little bit less uh, clear how you measure the extent to which people have appropriated those powers. But nevertheless, there is a strong component there that can be actually measured. In contrast to that, Marx thinks equality is a completely empty ideological concept that has no standing whatever. It has no uh, it has no value in itself. It gives you no uh, way of looking at society. It's completely empty. Now, I'll talk about that. I know you won't believe this, but I mean, nobody ever believes this when I say this, but uh, I'll, I'm, just, I'm just flagging it now, and I will come back to it and talk about it in, in detail uh, when we get to the uh, critique of the Gotha program. So it's really important to see that for Marx, freedom is part of science, equality is part of ideology. And now I'd like to say something about, uh, about, uh, about that distinction between science and ideology, and that I put on page 10a of my thing. So, as I said, it's really important for Marx that you see society as a historically self-transforming kind of entity. Society, you can't see society if you just look at a temporal slice. To do a historical sociology is completely pointless. You always, because things make sense only if you see them in the context of where they've developed from and where they're going. So you have to take a view of the historical development of society. Uh, that's the only context within which you can say anything specific. And now what Marx does is he essentially takes over this traditional idea from philosophy, which is the idea of substance and accident, and he develops that. That is, as you know, with Aristotle, Aristotle introduced this distinction into philosophy between substance and accident, um, and philosophers have talked about it at great length. And I think what's really important is to see that, um, that Marx has a certain development of that uh, concept uh, of substance and accident, which is the um, which is the thing that he uses uh, to, to underpin his his thinking about society. He has he has it, he takes it over from Hegel as he takes over most things from Hegel, and the and the idea is this: the original intuition. So society is a historical, potentially conscious and potentially self-conscious substance. So now first, what do we mean by the distinction between substance and accident? Uh, the original idea was the idea was that, that a substance was that which needed nothing else in order to exist. And an accident was that which was dependent on something else for its existence. And so the intuition behind this was if you talk about a gray cat, you can see that the cat is a kind of independent object that you can pick out. The, the, the cat is, can, you can predicate things of the cat, and the cat remains in existence. In contrast to that, the grayness of the cat has a different kind of standing. You can have a cat, and you can, you can paint the cat, you can dye the cat's hair. You can go to the local hair salon and you can dye the, the cat's hair so it's not gray, it's red. It's the same cat. So the cat is the substance and grayness or redness or greenness is an accident of that sub, sub, substance. The cat can somehow, and now the notion of a substance, there are two separate things connected in it and in Aristotle it's not quite clear. One is uh, a thing about which predicates can be made, and the second is something which maintains itself in existence. And he gets those two things pretty confused. Uh, 
is a substance anything you can talk about by itself as the subject of a sentence, or is a substance something which remains in the world? Cat, I can look at the cat, I can look at Tabitha and I can say, predicate, Tabitha is beautiful. But t that's a, a sort of predicative notion of subject. But it's also the case that I think that Tabitha continues to exist, even if I were to wash her hair and her hair were to become a, a lighter color of gray, gray black. So the substance is both the center of a of predication and it remains in existence. In contrast to that, grayness by itself doesn't exist. It exists only as the dependent property of something. My hair is gray, Tabitha's hair is gray, other people's hair is gray. So that's the intuition. Now, as people, people begin then, to characteristically in the philosophical way that they do, to do two things. One is they begin to move from these relatively simple examples. The cat is gray. The cat has a long tail. The cat has whiskers. Relatively simple examples. And to try to use this scheme for more complicated things. We can see that the cat has a tail. What can we say about the city of Athens? That the city of Athens has is anything like a, sub, a substance. So the cat is a substance relative to its grayness. Is the city of Athens a substance relative to its particular policy of invading Sicily? Now, Athens stays the same Athens even when it decides to invade Sicily, or even if it didn't decide to, to invade Sicily. So you can somehow talk about the city of Athens as a substance too, and you can talk about it, its contingent political decisions. So on the one hand, you move from these original examples, which are living things that are separate, to larger things. What can we say about a society that's substan about the substantiality of a society? And then second, that's one thing. You begin to change the subjects you talk about. Then the second thing is you begin to think more seriously and more stringently about what it means to say that something doesn't require anything else in order to exist. So of course it's the case that in one way Tabitha doesn't require anything else in order to exist. There she is compared to the color of gray that she has. The color of gray does require something else. It requires either Tabitha or a dog or me to instantiate it. So, but, but then you begin to say, well, but, but does that really, can, can Tabitha really be said not to require anything else in order to exist? And then you begin to think, well, uh, she's not really a substance because there she is, I can talk about her in, with a predicate, but it's not the case that she requires nothing else in order to exist. If you don't feed her twice a day, she meows. If you don't feed her at all for a week, uh, she falls over. If you were not to feed her for a month, she'd die. So there is some way in which these things, which are the original archetypical substances for Aristotle, namely animals, are not completely self-subsistent. They're not completely self-standing. They depend on other things in order to exist too. So the characteristic move in philosophy then is to move this concept of substance, to expand it, but also to make the requirements more stringent. So now suddenly, instead of being you're a substance if you're a thing that I can pick out and use a predicate about. You're a substance if you maintain yourself in existence. So Tabitha becomes a substance and the soap bubble is not a substance because the soap bubble emerges and, 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 and what do you say, platzt, platzt, uh, bursts. The soap, the Tabitha doesn't emerge and burst. She walks around. So now, a substance is a thing which is capable of maintaining itself in existence. It isn't just there, it's, it, and it, it doesn't just remain in existence, it is capable of maintaining itself in existence. She walks over to her food bowl, and by walking over to her food bowl, she takes nourishment. The nourishment is what's necessary in order to, to maintain herself in existence. Now, of course, if you begin that line of thought, you're in a way going to get somewhere, but in a way you're not going to get anywhere. Because then, of course, it isn't just enough that Tabitha needs the food in order to exist. In order to explain what Tabitha needs in order to exist, I'm going to have to get to bigger and bigger things. In order for the food to be there, it has to have been grown. In order for it to have been grown, etc. So 
so this is what Hegel says about the concept of, of substance. Substance starts out in this intuitive way, but the more you begin to think about it, the more you, th you realize that Spinoza is right. Namely, if you really take the concept of substance seriously, if you really say, this is a thing which has the property that it can maintain itself in existence and doesn't need anything else, if you really take that, then you'll find that the only thing that's a substance is the world as a whole, as a closed deterministic system. So the concept of substance, once you begin to think about it, moves, and it moves through individual animals, individual, so it moves through rocks and, and, and pieces and, and bubbles uh, to animals, and then it moves through human beings. And, and you can see that as it goes, it's, you're never going to get complete self-sufficiency, but the, uh, the characterization, the categorization of entities according to how self-sufficient they are gives you a good criterion for various things. So the cat is less of a substance than, say, the whole species of cat. So because the cat is to some extent a substance because the cat can go around and maintain itself in existence. The species cat can be seen as a bigger kind of substance because even though the individual cat dies, the species has more control over this. So, so you, and, and with human beings then, we can develop our control over the conditions under which we live. So that's the first part of the story. You begin to think about substance, you begin to take bigger things for substance, and you begin to think of the notion of being self-sufficient in a more stringent way. Then, of course, you think that whether, you ask yourself whether you can apply this way of thinking to a society. And there, of course, Hegel and Marx say the same thing. Yes and no. That is, of course you can, because, of course, like all of these other terms, this is the, the, the notion of substance and, and accident, like all other terms, is not a dichotomy. It's a mere relative distinction in a context, like all other concepts. But you can say the same thing about a society. You can say British society can be considered as a substance. And that means you can consider it as a now this notion of a self-reproducing system. So British society can be seen. So Tabitha is a substance by, able to, by virtue of being able to maintain herself in existence. She eats and she's able to work the next, she's a, sorry, she's able to sleep. She eats and she's able to sleep the next day. <laughs> uh, British society can be seen as, as the same thing. It's a group of people who are capable of a higher level of reproduction, of reproducing itself through time at a, at a higher level than she is, uh, and therefore there's some way in which it has more substantiality. Although, of course, it doesn't have absolute substantiality because it's not completely independent of the circumstances in which it lives. If a meteor hits us, we're gone. So we don't, we're not God, right? So the, the universe as a whole is, has complete substantiality, but we, we have a certain limited substantiality. So how this works then is that, now what, what this requires of course is having a criterion for when British, so Marx's idea is look at societies as if they were entities that were teleologically structured. Look at societies as, as if they were entities that were trying to maintain themselves in existence. They're trying to be substantial. They're trying to keep going. And the way we do it here is that means, and, and again, uh, you know the famous joke, in order for everything to stay the same, everything has to be completely different, right? That famous thing that one of the, one of the, uh, the, the noble people in Sicily says in Lampedusa, you know Lampedusa's, Lampedusa's novel, the, the Leopard, where there's, one of the, there's a member of the landed aristocracy who joins the revolutionary movement and he says, the only way to save the aristocracy is to change. And so that some of the members of the aristocracy are part of the revolutionary movement because the only way things can stay the same is that they be different. And of course it's right, the only th way things can be the same is if they're different. Namely, the only way British society can reproduce itself if, is if uh, I'm not here in a fortnight, right? So uh, we, uh, a society, given that it has to be historically extended, 
must be dependent upon a continual reproduction of different people. People have to go out and die. People have to come in. To say that the society reproduces itself doesn't mean, to say that the society reproduces itself doesn't just mean it, it gets together and, 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 and has a big orgasm of productivity and produces all these products. It means it maintains itself over the long run, and that means maintaining social roles, reproducing social roles, reproducing people who will take those roles, et cetera. Now, that means, of course, that the problem of identity becomes really, really complicated and important. Because we more or less know what we mean by saying that Tabitha is the same on Monday and on Tuesday. We more or less know what that is. We might not be able to specify it in detail, but we know what it is. But what does it mean to say that British society has maintained itself, has successfully maintained itself in existence? Uh, we know at a certain point uh, there was the Norman invasion and the upper class began to speak French. So you move from a situation in which everyone in the society speaks Anglo-Saxon to a situation in which everybody in society, as you know, in the end of the Middle Ages, Britain is a trilingual society. Famous, those famous documents that say the peasants speak Anglo-Saxon, the clerics and academics speak Latin, and people at the court speak French. So it's a, it's a, it's a stable, trilingual society that arises out of a basically monolingual society. Then gradually it changes. Now, do we say that British society has maintained itself identical through that or not? And Marx will say, well, partly the answer to that question will depend on what you mean by identity. What do you, what do you and that means it will depend on what you what you designate, what you characterize as the really important central and defining features and what you take to be merely accidental features. So is it important that at one point everyone speaks Anglo-Saxon and at another point uh, some of them speak Latin and some of them speak uh, French, is that important, or is it more important that the relations of agricultural labor remain the same? Because, of course, what happens is the Norman French come in and they take over basically an established form of land tenure and uh, land tenure and, uh, and, 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 and feudal obligations. And they, they change it in various ways, uh, but, the, but, the, but basically from a, from sufficiently, di from a sufficiently uh, um, um, disinterested uh, far view, there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, identity in the relations of rural production. There's a kind of identity there, and that might be more important than the fact that the upper class speaks Anglo-Saxon or the upper class speaks, um, speaks Norman French. So, so this is what Marx is thinking about. What does it mean? What are the central things in virtue of which you can say this is the important defining feature of the society, and if the society maintains that feature, then it is the same society. It has reproduced itself. Okay. Now, in the course of reproduction, if you and self-reproduction, if you are a society, you will need two kinds of things. One kind of thing you'll need is you'll need knowledge about the world. So as hu so, human society will be different from uh, amoebas in that an amoeba keeps itself in existence without thinking about the world. Uh, Tabitha, depending on your views about animals, keeps herself in existence by virtue of, I mean, she has a one-track, I mean, she has, she has meant, she clearly has mental processes, but they're of a relatively rudimentary sort. She, 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 she thinks like a philosopher, you know, she just has a one-track mind. There's food, there's not food. I know how to get to the food, I don't know how to get to the food. Basta, end of the discussion. So, but then, but Marx says you can't actually run a, run a society with mental processes like that. You need, you need knowledge. So part of the apparatus, through, so Marx's idea is to understand phenomena like science or technology or knowledge, see them in the first instance, don't look at knowledge and these things as a mirroring of the world, see them essentially as means in the, in the process in which a society reproduces itself. So scientific knowledge is, I use a hoe, I use a rake, I use various things, but I all, so 
So we get the allotment garden, and I go out and I dig with my fingers, and we use a hoe. And one thing we might use is we might use our knowledge of fertilizers. So our knowledge of fertilizers means we take the fertilizer and put it in the ground. Now, what Mark says is knowing that the fertilizer will do good is not in principle different from using the hoe. They're both components in this process by which the society is reproducing itself. So we're reproducing ourselves, and suddenly people discover that, um, discover that fertilizer can be produced chemically if you use certain formulae, and if you use that fertilizer, that will increase productivity. That is a, an archetypical scientific discovery, um, and it's it, it, it gives you, Marx says, the central uh, important thing about science, which is its technological applicability as part of the way in which uh, society uh, deals with the world and society reproduces itself. It reproduces itself by producing these things. And now, of course, once you have that knowledge of, once you have that concept of knowledge and of science, of course, you can generalize it and abstract it. So the Egyptians, as you know, discovered geometry by measuring things when the Nile floods, right? Uh, there's this famous story about the, 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 you know, every year the Nile floods, and then how do you find out what your plot of land was when the whole river valley has been, you know, you're a peasant, I'm a peasant, she's a peasant, we all have our properties. How do we find out what our property is when the Nile has come and washed all the landmarks away? If the Nile doesn't come, the land is not fertile and we can't do anything. But if it does come, all the, all the things are, are washed away. And so the idea is, well, they develop geometry in order to be able, after the flood, to tell whose property is whose property, right? So they have some fixed landmarks and they define things rel relative to that. Then, of course, the Greeks come along and they generalize that and they take that rough rough and ready rule of thumb, which is practical, the practical geometry that the, the Egyptians use, and we get Euclidean geometry out of it. So Marx says, it isn't impossible to get a Euclidean geometry. Uh, Euclidean geometry doesn't look as if it's actually practically of very much use, but if you actually look at knowledge as a whole, if you don't just look at it from the point of view of a, of, a, of a university, if you look at it as a whole, its position is its position in the social reproduction of society. And part of that can be, uh, can be the usefulness of these things, and it can turn out to be very useful to abstract from the particular context. It turns out that abstraction is one of the most useful things you can do. So it turns out that uh, you start out measuring uh, things on the Nile, and then, it, the, the, then Euclid comes along and he makes these, these, this, this, this set of axioms and an axiomatic system, and it can turn out that that can be part of the forces of production too. That can be part of the way in which the society reproduces itself, because once you have that schema, you can use it in other places. Okay, so that's one way that, that a society reproduces itself, through science. And science is then connected to these practical ways of dealing with nature. But there's another thing that societies do in order to maintain themselves and reproduce themselves in existence, and that is uh, it's a fact about human beings that we prefer not to be forced to do things. So a society will be more efficient and better able to deal with nature if the people in the society want to do what they have to do. Uh, so slave societies tend to be pretty inefficient. The slaves don't want to work, so you have to, so for every 10 slaves, you have to have an overseer with a whip. The overseer with a whip doesn't produce anything. He's there to keep the slaves in order. If you have 10 free peasants who are tilling the land in order to reproduce their families, they're likely to be easier, they're likely to be more committed to the work that they're doing, and they're likely not to need quite as strong a repressive apparatus. So there's a general tendency. So societies become more productive if the people in the society don't feel themselves to be forced to do the things they have to do, but if they can tell themselves the story that actually it's good 
for them to do what they have to do. So what I'm trying to say is ideology is a way of putting the police out of business. Uh, you remember when, uh, when Heine says about Kant, Kant took the morality of the German gendarme and he put the gendarme in every person's breast. Right? So Heine says about, about, about Kant, the, right, Prussia was famous for having a very efficient system of uh, gendarme, of, 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 of police. And now, and now what, 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 what Heine says is Kant really had a good idea. He found a way of making the external gendarme dispensable. You didn't have to have the gendarme anymore. Because if you train the people in an appropriate way, they'd put the gendarme in their own souls. If they went to the right kind of school, they would develop an internal view about the absolute necessity of doing their duty, about uh, duty being in conflict with inclination. And if they, if they assimilated that, then they'd want to do what they needed to do. You wouldn't have to force them to do it. Those things uh, uh, Marx call, calls ideologies. So an ideology is an ideational system. It's a system of beliefs. It's a system of attitudes which causes us to embrace the society that we have and to see that society as good and causes us as much as possible to conform to what we need to do anyway. Uh, now, I say an ideology is an ideational uh, uh, structure. Uh, I say that um, intentionally because, as you know, there was a big disagreement in the, in, the, in, the, in the 1960s and 70s between people who said ideologies are thought constructs and people following Althusser who said ideologies are apparatus. The, the central concept of an ideology is an apparatus. So, so, so Marx tends to speak, after all, the term ideology comes from idea. So he tends to speak as if an ideology is something like liberalism, or something like uh, 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 laissez-faire, or something like uh, Rawlsianism. That's an ideology, a set of ideas. But people have pointed out that actually, the, if, if you actually take Marx's view seriously, these thoughts don't, don't come from nowhere they'll be realized somewhere. They'll be uh, institutionalized somewhere. So, instead, so liberalism is an ideology, and you can talk about it as an ideology, but only because there's an apparatus, namely the school system and the newspapers, and that apparatus actually inculca inculcates this into people. So you can only understand the ideology if you see it as having some kind of realization in uh, a sector which is really an apparatus uh, which inculcates it into people. So, so the basic idea, now, and then, so Marx says, so therefore, ideologies will have the property that they will be, uh, they will be ideational, uh, they'll be ideational whips to whip people into thinking that what they need to do is what they ought to do, and what they ought to do is what's good for them. That's the, so as it were, uh, what, what you need to do, what you ought to do, what you want to do, right? Hegel says, in a good society, in a really good society, Hegel's model of what he calls Zittlichkeit, a good society which has good Zittlichkeit is, it's a place where what you want to do, what you ought to do, and what you have to do are the same thing. Right? So Hegel says, you can have a society in which these things are split, but a good society, in a good society, that, so his example of, th of this is marriage. He says, look, a, a good society would be one in which we have to have marriage, because we have to have marriage. He th he th forget, about, I mean, forget about the fact that he was an old fuddy-duddy and he was a pre-feminist, etc. Just, just suspend your disbelief about that. But he thought, we need marriage to have children and the, and the, and the, and the, 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 the social reproduction of children. So there's something necessary about the structure of marriage. Uh, if people have the right upbringing, it won't just be a necessity, a social, an external social necessity. They'll actually want to get married. Because if they have the right kind of, if they grow up in the right kind of society, they will have become the kind of people who can find their happiness only in marriage. 
And furthermore, he says, if you reflect uh, in a sort of Kantian way about universal structures, you can see that marriage is uh, something that's ethically uh, et can be ethically desirable. And so a good society would be one in which all three of those things were together. You, the, the social structure, the things that were necessary were also things that you really wanted to do and where you can find your subjective happiness and things that were morally acceptable. That would be an ideal good society. And now what Marx essentially says is if you think about that model Ideologies are forms of thinking that incorrectly put those three things together in circumstances in which they don't actually go together. So in an ideal society, Hegel says, uh, in an ideal form of Zittlichkeit, we'd have the form of marriage, we'd have a form of marriage which was the one that was necessary for reproduction, the one that people actually could find happiness in, and one that was morally you know, subject to the demands of universalization. But we don't have that. But, but Marx says, but we don't have that. We don't have that. But people think. But, but the form of an ideology is to make people think that. So the form of an ideology is, if you're a sort of post-feminist, to make women think that what they have to do in this society, namely entry to these particular kinds of monog monog monogamous marriages, is actually what they want to do. So the ideology, the ideology operates by, so Hegel, as it were, presents the model of the ideology, and, and Marx says, if you analyze this, you can see how ideologies work. Namely, they present a reality which is not ideal in that way, as if it were ideal, by, putting, by trying to identify these three things. Uh, and now, of course, as you know, he thinks that uh, justice has this property. The concept of justice has this property. The concept of rights and the concept of equality have this, this property, that, that the notion of a right is nothing but a conception which a particular society secretes around itself. So idea think of it this way. Ideologies are like the motor oil of the social mechanism. And the thing about a society is that a society is different from an automobile in that the society can create its own motor oil. This, so the society creates these ideologies to smear itself and make the wheels run more, uh, more, 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 more effectively. So notice, so from one point of view, one point of view, a completely detached point of view, an ideology does contribute in some way to social reproduction. It does contribute, it, but from another point of view, it does it by propagating falsehoods. So, uh, so Marx says about the concept of right, as you know, uh, as you know, the concept of right is a sort of invention of the of of, of the of, of the modern era, right? I mean, there are no rights in the ancient world. The concept you can't you can't. There's no way of saying right a right, in a way of speaking of a right in Greek. You can, you can speak of, uh, you can say, dikaios eimi, I am just in doing this, but this modern idea that I have a right to, people distinguish between subjective and objective conceptions of rights, right? Objective conception of rights is a conception that has this property. It is right that so and so, such and such. It is right that people not be murdered. It is right that uh, uh, workmen are paid for their, for their wages. It is right that so-and-so, this is objective. Then there's, a, then there's a subjective sense of right, which is I have a right, which is something like my own possession. The right is not an objective property, but it's something that's located in an individual. So the objective conception is it is not right that people in Athens get killed. The Athenians could say that, udikaion estin. It's not right, it's not just to do that. But they couldn't say, Joey Megacles has a right not to be killed. That's the shift. So there's a shift from an 
the, a conception which thinks of rights and these things as objective properties to one which thinks of them as possessions that have their locus in an individual. So instead of it's bad to kill people, I have a right not to be killed. And now that's a development. And Marx says, look, that's a development that's, uh, and as you know, it develops at the end of the Middle Ages, uh, going back to certain kinds of conceptions in, in Roman law. Roman law has, a, has, Roman law has some conceptions that are precursors of this. The Greeks didn't have them, but Roman law has some things. They weren't really conceptions of rights in the way we think about them, but they were sort of precursors of them. The notion of rights really gets started at the beginning of the, the modern age, and it's not uh, uh, an accident, Marx thinks, that it, gets connect, it gets, that it gets going in connection with incipient capitalist relations of, of, of ownership. So uh, the, the notion that there are such things as rights, namely subjective entitlements, absolute entitlements to things, is he says, that conception is a kind of creation, ideological creation, which is a creation made in order to make the distribution of rights that's necessary for this society to go on correctly uh, optimal. So it helps that society. So rights are always going to mirror the society that they that they, uh, uh, that they uh, uh, describe. Now, um, now, you'll of course say, well, no, 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 rights, um, oh, actually, rather than my ranting about this, the, uh, there's an interview that I gave to the South African journal called, journal of political, uh, called Theoria, it's called Rights, a Bad Idea, um, which, which you might look at, it's last year, it's called Rights, a Bad Idea, it's in Theoria. Anyway, so, so, so Marx's idea, so you might say, oh no, rights aren't always conservative. They can be, they can be revolutionary. You know, you, people, can, people can, can appeal to rights. And of course, they can appeal to rights in some contexts. But of course, they can appeal to Peter Rabbit, or they can appeal to religious views. People can appeal to anything in context. I mean, people, you know, the fact that people appeal to something in a certain context doesn't mean the thing they appeal to has any kind of cognitive content. Um, you know, they will, they will, you know, they will appeal to the will of God. They'll appeal to all sorts of things. So they appeal to rights too. And what Marx thinks is appeal to rights can, in some contexts, be. Uh, revolutionary. It can be re revolutionary. But appeal to God in some contexts can be revolutionary. And from the fact that appeal to God can be revolutionary, it doesn't follow that the concept of God has any content. And equally, from the fact that you appeal to rights, it doesn't follow that the concept of rights has any more cognitive significance than the cognitive significance of telling you what this society, the way this society needs to think about itself in order to function uh, efficiently. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's an important thing uh, about that. Um, and um, actually, that's all I'm going to say, because the time is almost up and I'm, I'm tired. So, and I want to start another topic next time. So uh, I'm going to talk next time of forces of production, relations of production, social formations. And then the last time, which will be Friday the 29th at 1300, in this room, unless you hear otherwise, um, I'll talk about uh, the labor theory of value and surplus value and things. OK. Bye-bye, people.